So um, I have uh, a really distinct pleasure to introduce Bitter Tang tonight. Um, and I think I always forget to do this, but I have to start by reminding everybody that this is an AIA, um, and we're laughing, because this is going to be very interesting. I believe somehow this is health, safety, and welfare, probably on what not to do, or what not to touch, because you may acquire some blister or something from it. I, anyway, but if you, um, if you require your credits, then you can come see Deidre Henneberry and, and uh, she'll sort something out for you. Because I don't believe there's a sign-up sheet because none of us thought this would pass. <laughs> so, Bitter Tang joined us last summer um, for our critical practice experience and they, they ran 10-week intensive workshops for us. And so we've, we got to know them in very, very interesting ways. Um, the one thing I want to point out, and I'm really quite short, is that it's the bitter tank farm. And the farm piece is really quite important because the methodologies and the projects and the things that they're interested in are not so much um, prescribed into the ground, but they're grown, they're nurtured, they're bred. Um, I promise that I wouldn't swear or use any R-rated words tonight. Um, Bitter Tang has assured me that this is a PG-13 rated lecture. And we are checking IDs at the door. <laughs> Ultimately, Bitter Tang is about pleasure. And that is something I feel we've lost in the social that we've, we've lost this sense that ultimately what we do is about people, and they're here to remind us. And I'd like to introduce uh, Antonio Torres and Michael Lovriff of Bitter Tank Farm. Thank you, Philip. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for your interest in the farm and in Bitter Tank. Uh, we're very happy to be back here, um, this time kind of presenting a little bit more of projects that um, we um, have been exploring for the past uh, eight years. Um, so Bitter Tang, the name Bitter Tang comes from a fruit. Um, this is kind of dates back to 2008 when Michael and I were roommates in New York City. And he came in one day, uh, totally freaking out and obsessed about grapefruits. And he just went on this kind of rant describing uh, this really interesting and, I guess, pleasurable experience he had with a uh, grapefruit. <laughs> um, and so uh, we discussed bitterness and tanginess. And, and then a few months later, I think we were uh, beginning to talk about uh, starting some sort of collaboration or, or work together and at the time we didn't want to call ourselves uh, something immediately associated with an architecture office because we didn't even know if we were going to be an architecture office. Um, it wasn't very obvious that we wanted to be Torres and Loveridge or the other way around. Um, and so uh, we, re I remember, we remember this kind of visceral uh, playful word, and that just kind of was it, right? Um, and so today we're going to talk a little bit more about where the farm uh, aspect comes in, and um, I hope that it's it's a little bit it's it's left clear that w we were initially w we were not initially thinking uh, uh, of our kind of body of work as a as a farm, but certain things just happen, um, and so we I mean. 
we were also discussing uh, that there might be some like uh, tax benefits to being a, a farm versus uh, an LLC. Um, uh, but the real reason we call ourselves a farm is because uh, we first decided to start working together and come up with the name. We were, make, we were working and making things like a giant pile of sweaty pigs that was to become a hotel proposal, a plush toy collection uh, with this mother and child as a mass head, which not only studied, that not only allowed us to study uh, pattern making for complex forms, but it also gave us the ability um, uh, of, and, and, and kind of begin to understand objects within spaces and, and how they can transform um, uh, the mood and qualities uh, of a space. Um, and the image on your right, um, it, it's about how one little creature could uh, turn a, a cute little room into something um, that can be read as potentially disturbing. Um, we were also working, or we also developed an aquaculture project, um, gelatinous orbs, orbs, which was an aquacultural proposal made from gelatin, where we were interested in creating a form out of a dissolvable material that would house young fish uh, and grow a reef system around it um, and attracting uh, wild fish. Um, and then it kind of had a, um, a, a lifespan uh, quality at, at tied to it, so this thing would eventually die. Um, here, uh, the sphere as a soft object creates a whole new world and environment around in which augmented and transform, in which it augmented and transform the sphere uh, into something much more. Uh, and in some ways, um, you know, we believe it was, uh, it gave it, uh, or given an aura. Um, as you know, we were also interested in objects um, and beginning to, to kind of test our projects at a, at a scale where uh, we, in this case, we explore a, a bird cage, uh, which is about bringing together captive and wild birds, uh, this time on land, um, to create new environments and frothy worlds uh, around um, these objects that uh, we were creating. Um, the idea of animal uh, particulate swarming around objects was further carried uh, using humans uh, with our pregnant piñata. Uh, a, a lot of you are not, uh, uh, you, you're, most of you here probably are aware of what piñatas are. We explore piñatas over the summer. Um, and in this case, uh, our piñata uh, had a sticky belly that attracted children to her, um, grasping at her body the idea of children being gathered uh, around her are, are as important and integral to the form as the form itself. Uh, humans as particulate become part of the object. Uh, so it felt more natural for us to call ourselves a farm and not a firm or something else. Once we did that, something happened that we weren't expecting. Uh, we started to think about how we work and the work that we do in a different manner Sometimes it's, it's similar to the ways in which farm, or a farmer thinks, and other times it's more metaphorical. But uh, by making uh, the decision to call ourselves a farm, uh, we transform the way we saw ourselves as well. Uh, we started to see objects um, uh, that, we cre uh, that we created um, had more qualities and and uses than what they were initially designed for. In the same way that people have started to use different animals in, in a multitude of ways. Uh, for instance, a cow poops, and that poop cannot be used, uh, can be used for fuel, but the cow also makes methane that attracts flies, which is hard to imagine uh, uh, fly-free cows. So they, they are as much as, uh, as part of a cow as, uh, as the cow itself. Uh, it makes, uh, the cow also makes milk, and the milk can be turned into cheese, and that cheese varies in flavor and texture depending on what the cow ate, um, uh, where it lives, and how the milk was, was handled. Uh, so a thing is never just a thing, uh, like a stapler is typically only a stapler, <laughs> or, 
or as was often thought in school of, of architecture was. So this is kind of important uh, to us um, as we also are involved in, uh, in teaching. Uh, so we are interested in things that create other, uh, that create their own auras or be used in various ways or be read in various ways. Um, our proposal for a fort uh, of inflated cow hides use all the parts of a cow to create an architectural enclosure. Uh, skins uh, for volume, bones were reconstructed to make posts and poles, and bladders used for decoration. Um, our backpack project uh, uh, uses various animal parts as well uh, to create things that uh, toot and squealed. <laughs> Here, lamb skins and lamb intestines are combined to create a backpack composite landscape uh, where breath can transform its volume and surfaces. Um, farms also evoke uh, a very specific and, uh, and spatial and sensorial qualities, and that they often smell, typically occur outside in open spaces, and firms don't. Other names um, don't have this sensorial quality to them. Um, and, and we liked uh, the aroma that a farm suggests. Um, you know, these this spaces uh, and things aren't so clean and precise um, in this kind of context. Um, we're also, this is something that we're also very interested in, and it's very specifically tied to farms, and that is life, size, life cycles. Uh, life cycles and lifespans are important to us. Animals and plants don't exist in a static state, but they are always changing and growing. We try to project, um, we, we try to make projects, sorry, that are constantly changing and shifting, growing, inflating, uh, deflating, dying, giving birth, <laughs> becoming diseased, procreating. So we often design our work to be slightly gimpy, so that when we start building them, they can, uh, they will become, they can become more complex or through methods of maintenance uh, or time, they can transform. Um, <clears throat> we operate this way primarily because uh, we are interested in architectural alternatives. And at the moment, that alternative, alternative is one where architecture is a pleasurable act, both for us, for us and the occupants. Um, we're really interested in architecture that allows people to uh, do things they wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't expect it to do. Um, so our first project uh, that we're gonna kind of go in a little bit into depth tonight, um, uh, directly channel a farm-like atmosphere. Um, and this was the design for a pop-up store for uh, fashion designer Michael Bastian in New York City. This was a competition, um, and the design was for a specific collection that he had designed that was based off of the American Gothic uh, of Andrew Wyeth, and um, we were also, he also uh, drew inspiration from uh, the Red Wing Blackbirds. Um, in the competition brief, Michael Bastian was talking about the American Gothic and how upon entering some of, the, some of these old New England homes, you could smell the furniture uh, polish, which was made from beeswax. Um, this little and tiny detail, which later on he didn't even remember um, kind of stating, uh, was the thing that hooked us into the project. Uh, we were determined to make uh, a space out of wax. Um, and so when we began to uh, kind of explore this, this, this idea of, of, uh, of making a, a, a store or a space with wax, uh, we immediately began ex experimenting with, uh, uh, with wax pellets and various uh, paraffins, uh, just to begin to test out uh, the different qualities and how we can actually produce uh, you know, a, a large quantity of it. Um, we also, uh, explore uh, the material qualities of wax and, and techniques for achieving transparency and translucency. Um, and, you know, in, in, in the end it was, I apologize for this image, not sure what's, why it's so blurry, but, um, <clears throat> you know, the, the, 
in the end, it was about uh, making wax uh, uh, or extracting the qualities of wax that we were really interested in, like smell, the way that it scattered lights, uh, scattered lights, and not uh, and trying hard to not make it look like plastic. Uh, we ended up proposing an interior, an interior filled with glowing wax walls, uh, whose entry was defined by feathers. So you can see here in the image. Um, since this was a store uh, that was filled, that, that, that was to fill an entire storage container, we devoted the front portion to, uh, to the space that defined, uh, to define the mood of the store, um, where there would be very little merchandise. Um, is there a maybe pointer? Or? Um, so you can see here in the plan as you enter, that very large room uh, was uh, completely uh, just dedicated for mood, and then the kind of merchandise uh, aspect was 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 pushed towards the back uh, into a, a very uh, small space. Uh, for the exterior, we were interested in creating a space far removed from uh, NYC, but at the same time tapping into the the feelings and sensations of upstate New York. Uh, hay was our uh, material of choice uh, for the exterior. Uh, we study the various uh, ways that one could work with hay and, and settle on, on the most informal, most uh, casual form, which was a, 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 a giant hay pile. And this is a, an image of a early model where we, been, we began to explore uh, piles that would kind of um, enclose a creepy space. Um, we were also studying how to recreate uh, the effects of a hay pile uh, without it being solid per se, or uh, how you could move through, how you can move through and, and under um, uh, without being completely filled uh, with hay. Um, this was a kind of final render, if you will, or image uh, that allow us to um, kind of uh, place our head around uh, the hay pile. Um, and this is the final installation. Um, but one, one other thing that was really interesting about working, uh, I think, specifically with the designer was also his interest in, in, in details. And we also were interested in developing furniture for the space. So um, once we had our kind of mind, uh, we, we, had our, we, had our, we had wrapped our minds around uh, you know the the, the mood and, and the kind of materiality for the the store. Uh, we began exploring um, furniture uh, uh, pieces uh, based on uh, American Gothic uh, furniture, and then the image of uh, the the two boys, which are, are twins, that was very important for Michael Bastian, and I, I felt we felt like uh, it also kind of added uh, to the creepy qualities uh, of, the, of the space that we were going for. And then another very important piece uh, that we latched on immediately was the Jenny Lim bed. And we didn't really just want to you know, put in a, a, a jelly, uh, Jenny Lim bed, even though there were quite a lot of uh, antique uh, kind of pieces that we explore in upstate New York that were pretty nice. So what we did is, we kind of deconstructed and, and, and used some of the, uh, and some of the parts by uh, creating this bed that was uh, kind of uh, formally tied to the twins. And so you can see that there's a, there's, there's a bed that splits into two. Um, and you'll see it in, a, in an image uh, in the space in a little bit. Um, but this, this is the kind of wall qualities and lighting qualities that we uh, ended up with. Uh, and here's an image. Oh my god. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, this is, uh, hopefully we'll have another shot of it. But um, we, you can start to see how uh, these uh, furniture pieces occupy the space. Um, here's an image of the feather wall. Um, it, they are real feathers, uh, black rooster feathers. Uh, um, and they were hand stitched uh, together. And that just also allowed a kind of threshold transition between the, uh, the, the, the twins' room, the kids' room, 
uh, the, the mood kind of space into where the merchandise was being uh, uh, exhibited or showcased. Um, and then this, 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 this room, the, everything was kind of fabricated by us. Um, we were really interested in continuing the exploration in, in, in detail, so we used uh, American Gothic details again, um, uh, using spindles for the, uh, uh, for the clothes hanger, and then um, uh, siding that uh, kind of was uh, designed in a way that uh, uh, just enhanced that experience of being in, in the back uh, room of, of this kind of creepy uh, space. Um, and there was a, a window to a, a secret um, garden that people could also explore. Um, so it was very important for, for our, uh, uh, for our work up until this point, um, and everything was kind of uh, was in this project. I, I would say that it was it was about exploring details and exploring ways of achieving precision without necessarily being too traditional about the way that you uh, create uh, uh, seams and transitions in architectural elements. Um, and as Antonio was talking about, we uh, spent a lot of time trying to develop a mood for this project, which was based off of uh, the Andrew Y paintings, um, and really kind of exploring pastoral uh, imagery. And the one thing that's actually also quite fascinating about this project is, um, again, like creepiness was a huge deal in this project. Um, and when, you kind of, when you're walking through New York, you could actually smell this thing from a distance. Um, and the entryway was actually like a little small hole, um, which you can kind of see on the right. Um, but most people that would come up to it were really scared to go underneath this thing. And so the pile actually helped to kind of reinforce also um, kind of a creepy, creepy atmosphere. So people always had to be encouraged to go inside of this. And so it really began to transform the way that people actually engaged with the shop. Um, but some of those characteristics we wanted to continue in um, our project Burrow Burrow, which was um, built in Illinois, um, and uh, kind of uh, continuing on with more pastoral qualities. Um, we wanted to explore hay further, but not in a loose pile, in a much more controlled manner using uh, hay-filled sausages. Um, this was actually a performance theater um, that was on the grounds of a mansion um, in Lake Forest. And um, this was kind of the beginning of a program that they've, they started where they're trying to get architects to come out and propose a new landscaped amphitheater uh, in a location where there used to be performances 100 years ago. Um, so our proposal uh, was a reinterpretation of that uh, previous, they called it the Ragdale Ring. Um, and so. It was kind of tapping in geometrically with the former ring, as well as uh, producing um, an amphitheater that merged with the landscape. Um, a lot of the interest in this was uh, how could we, these are all uh, competition proposal entries, um, images that we showed, but the idea was to look at how you could actually make an amphitheater be both the ground plane that you actually, actually are able to sit on as well as the covering for um, an amphitheater space. So the performances could actually occur underground, basically, under the ground of the amphitheater. Um, the section uh, also kind of uh, looked at uh, trying to convey sort of two different sides to this. Um, the exterior, as you saw in the original image, was much more about kind of uh, appearing as a, a strange mound in the landscape, the interior became much more uh, articulated in terms of color, in terms of lighting, um, and plants growing through it. Um, these were the, uh, our, building our building components, which are hay wattles. Um, they do pretty interesting things. They're really affordable. Um, we had to study multiple different ways of structuring this thing. Um, and a lot of different study models, uh, again, kind of related to the other uh, BOFO project where we are actually looking at how do you make a giant hay pile but also make it hollow in the center. And so we had devised this 
uh, bedding structure that would then uh, be covered in the hay wattles. Um, and uh, models are really huge part of our design process. So these were study models that we did to further convince the client that we could actually pull this off and what it might look like. But we also, in the model, explored um, different fillings. So this is actually made out of rice. Um, but, uh, and then this was the uh, install image. And so when you, the entry um, to the project is from the rear, which you saw in the original image. There is a little back door entry into this space. So this is where perform performers could enter um, and come out onto the stage. Um, you can see it in the back of this image. Um, the interior, we actually had to structure with uh, trusses that were painted red. Again, kind of working with this barn-like quality, with this uh, pastoral imagery, we were actually uh, chose a barn colored red, uh, like one of the most basic uh, or common uh, reds that was available. And then from the structure, some of these wattles hang, hung down. This was uh, immediately after. Uh, installation, but plants started to um, dangle down from above um, as well. Okay. Interior space. Um, and then at night, it was illuminated um, and glowed in various different ways. Um, and here is a performance. This was an opening that uh, everyone's sitting in chairs. Uh, it was an older crowd. I think so. Uh, they weren't sitting on the hay waddles. Actually, that's right. It also rained like for four days straight right before this happened. There was a huge pond in front of this. Um, luckily, it dried out just in time. Um, but what, I mean, one of the big things about working with hay uh, and uh, in all of our projects that we do find interesting is their ability to grow and transform. So. It was actually fantastic that it rained right before, because these things became super heavy and really soggy, um, which of course encouraged uh, the seeds that we had planted. There was a lot of grass seeds. We had also planted some plugs. Um, but uh, it also, um, the smell was quite fantastic, actually. Like wet hay sometimes smells bad, but at this moment, it smelled pretty good. Um, and so, you know, again, this thing, you can actually smell it sometimes before you actually see it. Um, and then also uh, a couple weeks into the growth, like new growths were starting to come out of it. Mushrooms love growing in hay. And so this thing just started to grow and grow and transform. Um, we did grow some weird slime molds, apparently, that the uh, owners were, uh, the client was very freaked out about until I had to convince them that it was totally healthy. It was, apparently. Um, <laughs> but this idea of growth was um, something that was uh, kind of early on um, explored in our projects, where we were really kind of looking at a way of producing um, ecosystems, um, and which we find, um, and we, everyone that was here this summer heard us talk about ecosystems, so I'll spend a little bit of time um, talking about this uh, as, um, like ecos we c talk about ecosystems because uh, everyone talks about atmospheres or like environments and things like that. But our interest in ecosystems is that it's more about um, kind of a complex system of uh, interlocking parts and that all kind of contribute to an overall environment. So you can have an atmosphere, but you can have a single material produce an atmosphere. An ecosystem is a much more complex idea. Um, and so uh, for this project, this was, a, again, a competition entry uh, on farming, and we are very interested in trying to create a new sort of, um, uh, at the time it was atmosphere, but environment. Um, and so we are proposing this um, aquaculture project, which would be made out of gelatin. So it's a giant gelatinous orb um, that you could uh, fill with uh, baby fish, they would grow over time, but because the, um, the orb is actually um, organic, you could also embed it with seeds and other things that would start to grow algae or other plant life. And pretty soon, uh, wild fish um, would start to uh, 
come around this thing, it, it would become a new reef. Um, and as, at the same time that it's growing, it would also be decaying um, because the gel gel gelatin would slowly be dissolving in the water. Um, and so there would be ways of being able to control like how long this thing would last based on how thick the gelatin would, was. And so this was an idea of maybe doing um, kind of a catch and release, um, uh, not catch and release, but uh, rearing young uh, fish to then release them into the wild. So protecting them when they're small so that they could uh, uh, increase the fishing stock. Um, but so <coughs> the life cycle of uh, the orbs were really important to us in terms of how it transforms an object in space, but um, as well as how it begins to um, produce new environments. And so the first image, or the first uh, orb is when it gets deployed, and then the final one is when all the fish run free. And so this sort of idea started to create kind of new ideas about what underwater space could be like. Um, a couple years, I don't know, a long time, 10, 2010 or something like that, um, we entered a competition uh, for, um, to design a suka, and if you guys don't know what sukas are, they are these, um, uh, actually I think suka just happened a couple weeks ago, but in the fall, uh, it's a Jewish holiday, and they um, build these structures out um, uh, outside of their homes, and uh, it's supposed to uh, remind them of their, I'm hoping I'm getting this right, the, the 40 years of travel in the desert, and so there's all these rules that um, are kind of tied into the building of a sukkah. Um, and these are some of the rules that they provided for us. And there's some really fascinating ones, like you could actually use a whale to build a sukkah in. Uh, and so once we saw all these lists of building materials, we were definitely like on board with this idea. Um, <clears throat> and um, it was also kind of interesting because um, well, I'll get to it in a little bit. But so there's this, uh, what we wanted to do is because it is a temporary structure, we are very interested in um, transportability. Um, and so we were actually looking at blow, um, blowfish as a uh, kind of a precedent, um, in, like looking at inflatables um, as a way of producing a, a transportable pavilion. Um, but we also knew that there was a lot of very um, uh, important ac uh, social activities that occur on the inside of the suka, and we knew that if it was going to be selected, it would be built in the middle of uh, Union Square in New York. So we wanted to make sure that the environment that you're going into when you entered our pavilion was a very secretive or not secretive, but at least um, separated you from New York quite a bit. So you wouldn't necessarily hear all the sounds of everyone in Union Square around you. So we wanted to make sure that there was really thick walls. And we <coughs> kind of viewed this as a inverted plush toy, um, our project. So inverted plush toy on the left, on the right, a plan of our project. Um, and so that when you enter into this thing, it's completely organic on the inside. Um, completely hairy, we wanted it to smell. So it was filled with uh, eucalyptus leaves as well as Spanish moss. So um, when you entered into it, it was a sensorial experience. Um, and the thick inflatable walls actually prevented you from hearing a lot of the outside noise. So um, again, kind of the proposal for it, uh, we did want it to take on an animal-like form. Um, and so, for some reason, I see a puppy in this thing. I don't know what you guys see, but <coughs> it might be a little bit weird. Uh, this is a uh, proposal for the, uh, the drawing. So this is kind of showing uh, what the <coughs> inflatable would look like and where the Spanish moss is in the kind of lower area with the eucalyptus kind of coming up from above. Um, and then a detailed shot of how that actually got manifest. Um, again, there's like, the really kind of fascinating things about this is that uh, it is a space for engagement. Um, and anyone who's ever lived in New York, you are surrounded by a lot of people, but it's also a very lonely place. So we kind of thought that maybe the appropriate um, 
like filling for the um, pavilion would be a pillow. And we called it the pillow of loneliness because it was something that uh, if your lover happened to be gone, uh, you could use the pillow as a form of comfort for you. And so it has this um, large flat body with a head that moves around and so that, you, and the head is actually weighted down with a lot more um, weight so that you can lay it on your chest and it really feels like someone is keeping you comfort. Or <laughs> um, and there it is in Union Square. There was a uh, eleven or ten other ones that were built, so eleven total. Um, it's kind of a view from the inside, looking out. Uh, but one of the interesting things about it too was just that um, we made our proposal, and then there was a rabbi that actually checked it out and was like, "No, this doesn't quite uh, work." You, you're, you can see on the. Um, we had this, the eucalyptus crown, but the, you can't have too many holes in your roof. And we had a hole that um, four fists could fit through. And so we had to reduce the scale of it. And so there was a lot of back and forth between us and the rabbi to get the scale exactly right, um, so that only four fists could fit through the hole. Um, eventually, we got it. We got approval. Um, so it was good. But, um, and these are just some more kind of shots of the layering of organic materials. So in 2013, uh, three years later, we had already kind of made our name, I guess, for ourselves in New York. And um, we were contacted by the people at Storefront for Art and Architecture. Um, and I feel like they were kind of looking for someone crazy enough to uh, do a project where they can fit, uh, I think it initially it was more than nine, but we ended up with nine different spaces um, in this tiny gallery. So um, Bean was, again, a project uh, for uh, Storefront for Art and Architecture. Um, and they requested uh, these nine rooms uh, that were to be defined uh, by uh, an action, um, and uh, these are some of the, the these are the, the, the final uh, kind of terms and actions that we uh, explore. Um, the The title of the ex, uh, ex, of the exhibition uh, was Bean, and, and it was about uh, leaving storefront, uh, not uh, through like I guess it was like three different uh, periods, past, present, and future. So that was a kind of important exhibition uh, for us and for them. Um, so nine rooms uh, were initially uh, requested to be separated. And this is kind of what some of the, uh, and I mean, when we, when we began to explore this project, it was, it was, it was, it was hard, it was, it was about developing kind of different strategies of how to actually work with the, the nine different rooms and how to actually program this kind of triangular shape that obviously pinches at one end and, and amplifies on the other. Um, but, you know, it became more apparent as we kind of explore the project a bit more uh, that the, the spaces didn't have to necessarily feel detached or independent from each other, but they needed to begin to uh, interlock and, and overlap um, so that um, like their own qualities uh, would you know, begin to kind of intersect and create this kind of interested, interesting uh, interstitial uh, kind of interactions and, and spaces. Uh, so this was uh, uh, the, the plan, uh, the floor plan, um, which then transformed from uh, one of from like, you know, different spaces into uh, a space uh, where the boundaries of each of the actions and the spaces were blur um, and expanded based on the materiality uh, of the spaces. Um, the floor plan itself and, and the architecture itself became a large ecosystem um, and a, a being in, in its own uh, right. <clears throat> so here's... Uh, the plan with, you know, how we ended up uh, kind of conceiving the nine different spaces. 
the system that we developed uh, ended up producing more architectural parts than just the rooms themselves. Um, and then to build up um, the kind of unify qualities of the entire em environment and, um, and also uh, it, it defined uh, the overall mood of the space. Um, these, we use these uh, features like color, uh, which you can kind of, uh, kind of sense and, and, and see throughout the entire uh, space, uh, wall, furniture, uh, which kind of uh, worked on the interior and the exterior. And, um, and then we made a, a, a giant edible wall uh, that kind of tied the entire um, uh, gallery um, made out of uh, rice paper. So at this point, uh, we were also beginning to be very interested in uh, kind of reconstituting, uh, I guess I would say like products typically kind of associated more with uh, food, um, but that also are uh, things that we uh, directly kind of tie to the farm as well. So. In this case, the rice paper wall is one of the most sensorial components uh, to the environment, and, and that is, um, you know, kind of held off the wall via a net, um, and it's illuminated from behind, um, which also kind of emitted its own fragrant and, and, and color. Uh, the wall uh, became such an uh, important feature and interactive tactile feature that um, the curators of, 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 the, of the show decided to also kind of use it as a display uh, wall. So this kind of very important art artifacts uh, from the storefront archive uh, were pulled out to be kind of displayed behind this wall. Uh, I think that perhaps the, the fact that the wall forced people to get up and close to it uh, might have triggered uh, the reason for why someone ended up licking the wall right in front of Michael, which he almost had a heart attack. He was really excited about it. And is this, this was one of the things that we uh, just enjoy when people, uh, you know, kind of feel the, the, the intention and, and the interact, in the, and, and sorry, the, the, the action and, and, and the interaction is a lot more visceral. Um, here's a, a shot of uh, the connect uh, table, which the table became this interactive piece that uh, when used, uh, the table will uh, function as a, as a flat, uh, as a flat uh, kind of, uh, piece made out of different um, uh, tabletop sizes, and then when it was not used, it would it would kind of uh, fold uh, vertically. Um, the goal was, uh, you know, the goal was cr uh, also was about creating um, a new ecosystem um, in 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 building up the context that allows people to interact with their environments in new ways. I mean, this is was. A kind of challenge for us at the beginning, but then once the uh, spaces began to uh, interact and, and relate and tie and bound it by light and, and color, um, things began uh, to kind of uh, work uh, towards our advantage. Uh, this is the dream space. Um, is a I guess I would describe a little bit the image. This is a woman laying on a waterbed, uh, which is also materials that are not foreigner, foreign to a lot of the people who were partic participated in the workshops in the summer. We were working with water. This began this kind of fascination and exploration on uh, water projects for us as well. Uh, this is a view of the Amplify space um, where we kind of wanted to create um, depth and uh, multiple rooms at the or create the sensation of being in, inside a larger uh, space in multiple rooms, right at the at the at the point of the of the space where it's 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 gets uh, pinched. Um, uh, the brief came with the desire to dispense fortune cookies. Um, 
uh, the curators had this uh, whole thing about around fortune cookies. I can't remember <laughs> exactly, but we just knew we had to create about uh, you know 300 or 400 uh, pieces that would uh, help in kind of dis dispense this fortune cookies throughout the three months that, that the uh, exhibition uh, was up. So um, we explore uh, ways. So this is a uh, early uh, kind of mock-up of what we ended up then kind of pushing forward. Uh, but it needed to be, I guess from a, a kind of functional point of view, like it, it had to be something that, it was, that could easily be refilled um, it had to be something that um, uh, allowed someone to uh, just not spend any time on it. So for us, it was an opportunity to then uh, make it uh, m all about how do you engage with this uh, piece that um, hangs from the, 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 the ceiling and, and you had to kind of pull and, and tug on this uh, super... Uh, tactile um, uh, piece to extract the, uh, the fortune uh, cookie. Um, so this was, uh, this was, a, it was all about creating this very uh, tactile and visceral um, experience. Um, so there's a drawing that kind of also uh, begins to talk about the materiality uh, of the piece in, in drawing form and how uh, you know, the, the actual piece behaves as one kind of pulls the uh, fortune cookie almost in a slow mo capturing almost in slow motion. Um, it's a shot of how, again, uh, all these elements begin to uh, appear uh, in, in different spaces and um, they, they, this, these pieces were so successful for us and so fun that um, they became a field uh, of holders that started to articulate space, fill in the, the gaps, and create clouds of, um, of I guess, like architectural space. Um, here's a shot at the uh, at this uh, fortune cookies holders and the table, the connect uh, table uh, in its uh, kind of upright position. Um, so the tech. Utility of these uh, fortune cookie holders, it, you know, like it's all about the pleasure of pulling out a fortune cookie from these things. And without actually doing it, it's kind of it is kind of hard to understand. But because of the way that these things would grasp a hold of the fortune cookie, and the way that you would have to pull it down, and the way that the elastic uh, hanging would work with your hand, and the way you pulled it down, it was <coughs> so visceral. Um, and that once you released the fortune cookie from the holder, the things uh, bounced back up. And so it then began to animate the space through, uh, it's kind of like those of you who know what uh, Johnny Jump Ups are like, it's kind of like a baby sitting in some sort of uh, <laughs> bouncy chair. Um, so pleasure is hugely important to us. Um, and, <clears throat> you know, it's more than just. Uh, constructing like these environments is also about the human engagement and so uh, this was a very early study of like looking at how architecture can be much more engaging with the human body I mean it is one of the most engaging um, forms out there in that you're always at least walking on it so your feet are always kind of engaging directly with uh, architecture as well as your hands when you're beginning to um, open a door or things like that. But we wanted things to be much more uh, engaging and pressurized and so that the architecture might actually push back on you. Um, so this was looking at a way of moving from one level to the next for a children's bedroom. Um, and basically, rather than like <coughs> um, just going through a hole in the ceiling or going up a regular stair, there is this idea of uh, climbing up a ladder um, and going through a hole that's upholstery lined um, that kind of pushes back on you. And so there's this uh, series of studies that are about like how, what it feels like for someone to actually go through one of these openings. And so here, architecture actually is something that really pushes back on you. It's something that you feel as you're transitioning through spaces. Um, 
And so we kind of, um, at the time we were, and still are like super fascinated by the Rococo. Um, and thinking, well, it was like, how do we begin to talk about pleasure in an architectural way and kind of looking at what would the precedence for that be? And the Rococo actually becomes like a very uh, ideal place to start. Um, and we just were extremely interested in the way that social behavior was kind of changing at that time. And it's represented in the paintings in the way that bodies start to lay over each other. There's new interactions that are going on. And, you know, um, ergonomics are a big thing, or I don't know if they still are a big thing, but they were at least. Uh, in terms of like increasing uh, efficiency or uh, increasing health, um, body posture, all of these things. But we were looking, we were thinking that, well, that's not exactly what we're about. We're actually uh, looking at, uh, at something that's a little bit more erogenous, that there's something a little bit more pleasurable. So uh, kind of came up with this term, erogenomic. Um, and so, uh, again, like how could we begin to create uh, an architecture that is much more uh, erogenous versus uh, ergonomic? So, like, <clears throat> You know, this was, a study, this was studied in furniture, the plush toys, the pinatas. Um, but it also ended up becoming explored in the ways that, um, in the building materials, the materials that we actually used, and that there was much more, uh, you know, it's not about things that don't react or, uh, I mean, like wood, it's pretty much what it is I mean, until you start carving it. Um, but like in these waddles, the way that you carry it, they start to engage with the body in a much different way and they start to transform. Um, and <coughs> got a video here. Uh, <coughs> and also just, um, this was just showing how uh, Burrow Burrow was built, but uh, we had to develop sort of new techniques for like lifting these things up 25 feet in the air. Um, but they started to take on, when seen in isolation, they um, started to uh, have their own sort of animal-like qualities as they were moving through space. Um, so for our project, Verbal Bup, um, carrying uh, on, oh, I'm really loud, uh, with um, uh, the Rococo and Pleasure. We were like studying uh, some of the pleasure palaces of the Rococo and the neoclassical period, which are really about integrating structures and pavilions with landscape. Um, and we wanted to um, develop um, an idea about aggregation that wasn't necessarily about um, gluing things together or bolting things together. So we are very interested in uh, friction fits. Um, and so we were trying to look at how you could aggregate a structure um, and looking at pleasurable forms of aggregation, I guess would be the way to talk about this. And so the Kama Sutra is a great sort of example of combining self-similar forms in various different ways. So that kind of became uh, an inspirational um, starting point for how to look at how you could begin to modify form um, and Multiple, and how multiple forms could interact. So we did um, a, a few different studies um, with kind of a shape that we had started with, uh, looking at different ways of um, connecting the pieces. Uh, and the, we were really interested in kind of making this form that had a hole in the center and then uh, what we called a head and two legs. And that um, the way of connecting would, through friction fits would be about maybe one head and one leg going through the hole of another, and that tension between those uh, objects would start to um, hold them into place. And so we proposed this giant orgy of uh, new architectural beings, uh, which are the competition loved, um, but through we had to keep refining it and cut down on the costs a lot, so we ended up proposing something much more PG-rated, where um, none of the uh, holes were actually filled in this case, but um, all the it was basically two legs and a head were kind of bound together. Um, but apparently, uh, when this was released, there was some pretty decent press um, on it, which uh, was kind of exciting. Uh, so, <clears throat> um, because we couldn't use friction fit um, in 
the proposal that we ended up having to go with because of uh, cost and everything else. We had to develop another uh, methodology of connecting these pieces together. And so, again, looking into pleasure, we decided that uh, maybe there was bondage where that we could actually give these uh, animals. Um, and so we developed our own sort of um, uh, tripartite bondage piece that actually um, allowed the bups to join together. Um, and <clears throat> so this probably should have happened a little bit earlier, but it's describing the anatomy <laughs> of the piece. But then also people start to engage with this thing. Uh, I mean, you start to see things in, in these things and the way that they are starting to dangle they were very interactive. Um, so this was the installation of the piece. Um, kind of multiple inflatables, there's all these parts hanging down. And definitely, I mean this... Another licking. Another licking. So, I mean, like this is great that we actually captured this because this thing got in, uh, played with so much and uh, in so many different ways. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, so, we would really wanted to push this further into the final project that I'll talk about, which is our proposal for uh, the PS1. Every year they have the warm-up series. Um, and in the past, typically these things are always like very um, delicate. They aren't really, actually I think PS1 might have told us not to really make anything that you can engage with, but that's like, why did you select us? Yeah. But uh, so we wanted to go against that and definitely make something that was very bodily, something that was much thicker, something that would really change uh, the courtyard space. Um, and so we've been working with water, and working with bodies, working with atmospheres. So uh, and there's dance parties that happen here. And so we knew that people get sweaty. New York is hot, it's humid, there's water everywhere. So we really wanted to kind of play with water, sweat, um, and combine all these things into um, a project. And so it's like, how do you build something out of water? Um, one thing we did was begin by looking at different sort of scales of water, or how water interacts in different um, environments. So um, this is a, a clip of, um, a movie called Microcosm. I highly recommend everyone going out and watching this. Um, the full thing. But we love the way that, like, <clears throat> you know, we interact with water in a very specific way. And these bugs have a totally different interaction with that. Um, I mean, that's amazing. Like, we want to do that. Or, look at that. Drinking out of water, or water droplet. Um, or looking at water in space. So, or zero gravity. I'm not sure if this is in space or not, but. Um, But water, again, it's able to take on completely different forms than what we're used to seeing. Um, so we explored different ways of dealing with it on Earth, dealing with it at the scale of a human, uh, and trying to figure out if we could get some of these qualities um, at that scale. So various different ways of containing water, various different ways of looking at uh, water effects, um, exploring all the different stages of water, all the different states that, um, from uh, <coughs> liquid, solid, gas, gels, frothiness. Um, and we wanted to construct an architectural environment uh, and infrastructure that would support all this water. Um, the great thing about um, the PS1 courtyard is that it's completely walled off from um, the surrounding uh, context. There's only one way of kind of walking into here. And so we wanted to make sure that the party goers that would go to this environment would feel as though they're going into an entirely new world. 
And so <laughs> this image is kind of reinforcing that in terms of the way that uh, we were trying to <laughs> isolate it within a, uh, a cloud clearing. Um, and so a lot of the forums, too, were also about kind of being somewhat familiar, but also being totally foreign. Um, and even in some of our initial studies of, uh, this was a proposal that didn't go anywhere, but there was always like dinosaurs that were occurring in our original imagery as a way of reminding us that this needed to be a primeval environment. We wanted this to feel as though it was a world uh, that no one had ever been to. Um, and <clears throat> uh, so what we ended up settle, uh, producing, kind of building off a bunch of our uh, previous projects is what we uh, call a conical forest, which was kind of the way that you would move into the space. Again, this is hay coming um, into the project, but it's about kind of organizing space in terms of upward facing cones and downward facing cones um, that start to create like an entry uh, arcade where the atmosphere in the space is completely different uh, under there. It would probably uh, be cooler um, because there's so much shade and shadow. And then uh, <clears throat> it would, again, like all, all the other projects that grow over the course of the summer would start to grow different plants. Um, and then also just looking at kind of the formal qualities. Uh, I think we call this the marsupial nipple. It's very like nipple-like, which is good. This is, these are kind of models. But one of the th interesting things about this too was that you know, this arcade was actually an occupiable arcade. Like typically PS1 is something where uh, it's in general uh, pretty open space, but we did want to produce smaller enclosed spaces that were uh, built for two people uh, so that you could go in there and kind of allow yourself to separate from the crowd. Um, and this is kind of a view from within those spaces. So this would be uh, <clears throat> what it would look like on installation. And then after it would grow um, throughout the summer, it would transform into a green environment. Um, got some views from underneath the conical forest. And then one of the things that was really big um, was, again, kind of working with oops, um, uh, the party atmosphere and working with water is that we <clears throat> wanted to create one uh, like architectural element that uh, might relate to a dance party. And so we were re really interested in the disco ball. Um, and we we're like, how can we make the disco ball be, be made of water? How can we make it be huge, something that you could actually touch, uh, something that might actually cool the environment, something that would actually uh, activate dancers or people that are in need of rest. Um, so we designed this giant uh, sphere in the center um, that was actually filled with water. There's a structure underneath it so that it could be illuminated from the inside, but it would be something that would change color. It would actually be, it's kind of like a uh, soggy fountain in a way. Um, it would actually be oozing liquids um, from portions of it, so you could actually crawl into it or like uh, have a foam party in it. Uh, so it could be used in a bunch of different ways while always kind of transforming um, color or texture, coolness. So this was a model study of the, kind of the foamy garden. Um, and <clears throat> as you can see, the final image of this is that it kind of becomes, we couldn't have anything within the actual dance floor but it would become the kind of the backdrop for that. Uh, and it could be programmed in different sorts of ways. Uh, it, could, uh, it could actually make noise as well, uh, kind of bringing back the bagpipe into this. So it was kind of a multi-sensory uh, kind of installation within the overall atmosphere of the PS1. Um, so a lot of this is just, uh, in the end, there's kind of an idea of bring together um, ecosystem, the idea of an ecosystem, which is about creating an atmosphere of multiple different parts, uh, multiple different components that have their own sort of uh, language, their own sort of attitude, their own sort of being um, to produce new environments. Um, and that the human is a huge part of that ecosystem, of that environment, and to engage with them in some sort of new way and so that <coughs> Hopefully, 
We can change the way that people socialize, the way that people interact with each other, the way that architecture performs. So that is the end of the show. Thank you. Does anybody want to make a statement? <laughs> I'm not asking. For, I don't want any questions. I just want statements tonight. It's very interesting, the uh, yeah. <laughs> Do you need me to explain that to you? <laughs> Some people get confused by it. <laughs> yes? Actually, it's a question. <laughs> Hello, uh, you're a firm or company or group. We grow and contract, um, like a lot of things, based off of the size of the project that we have or um, what's going on. So it's always us two. And then, I mean, uh, a lot of these projects we grow um, once we get them. So I think the biggest we've Ben was, was there five employees? Yeah, five. Uh, but we keep it small. So, I mean, and just to add a little bit to that, um, all the projects that we showed, the build projects, um, they were all also built uh, by us. Um, and so that's when uh, we tend to kind of need more help. And so we resource. Uh, you know, where we look at schools or where we're teaching, and people are usually very um, interested in, in engaging with construction of these projects. Um, and so that's why we're kind of always changing in terms of like our size. And actually, uh, the Borough Borough project was actually the biggest uh, size that we were. And that was actually kind of an awesome competition because. Uh, we actually got to live in this mansion for three weeks and actually... Uh, with the chef. With the chef. <laughs> we had our own personal chef. But they also supplied space for 10 additional people. So we, we were big at that time. That was pretty fun. It was like a summer camp. <clears throat> it's a good competition to look at actually in, in, in the Midwest. It's, it's the Ragdale Foundation um, Performance Ring or something yeah. like that it's called. Thank you. Oh, wait. <laughs> yeah, it was a great presentation, so I think it at least deserves a couple of questions, too. Um, I, your presentation made me think of time and the role of time in design and architecture. And I mean, you talked a fair amount about it, but I wouldn't say it was explicitly called out as you know, part of every project, but I think it was embedded in every project. And what interests me is, the way you kind of uh, redefine when a, a traditional project may begin and end by this idea of uh, including the act of construction as part of the project in the sense of a, almost like a performance is the way I'm reading it, mm -hmm. uh, especially when you, you talked about the idea of like hoisting the, uh, I forget what you call them, the sausages, the sausages. sausages. yeah. <laughs> So hoisting them and this, like the idea that construction is actually a temporary performance, a public display of performance, yeah. which to me is really fascinating and I think um, sort of re reframes the way I think about uh, construction and architecture. Um, so thank you for that kind of insight. Um, and I think my question has to do with what I'm also noticing is a lot of the projects are maybe month to uh, several month uh, installations. They have like sort of a lifespan. Um, and I'm wondering if, if this approach, um, like how your approach may change if say you're, the project were a 10 year project, a 10 year lifespan, a 25 year lifespan, a 50 year lifespan of a project. If you've encountered that, if, if you think that your uh, approach might change if you were to encounter a project such as that or uh, if you'd be willing to speak to, to the role of time in, our, in architecture. Yeah. Well, definitely a big thing. And, and <laughs> I'll just bring up one thing uh, before 
to your question, uh, I mean, the idea of uh, the construction of the performance is a huge deal. Because actually, one thing that always happens too, uh, most of these things were built in New York. And recently, I had to carry the pinata to my storage unit. And so I had to carry it through the streets, but it was wrapped up in a plastic bag. I was about to get into my storage unit. These guys pulled up. Well, I saw them drive by. Then they came back, stopped, jumped out of the car, ran up to me. One was on the phone. And he's like, stop. What's in there? Is that a body? He was on the phone calling the cops to make sure that I wasn't carrying a body. And so they kept <laughs> So, I mean, and this happens with almost every project. It's like, because you're bringing, like, these weird things through the city. And, uh, I mean, so that was something that, like, just being in New York was kind of interesting in terms of, like, every time we had to move a project, it was, like, this huge performance. Um, but, uh, so, yeah, time, um, extremely important. We haven't, uh, no one believes that we can do something that will last more than three months. <laughs> uh, so uh, we actually haven't entered a competition that would explore those uh, like other sensorial things that would have a, like a longer time. Um, but I think it's definitely something that we are super fascinated in. Um, I think it changes the way that we would approach the material for sure. Um, and that there, are, I mean, every material and every sort of interaction has some sort of age to it. Um, so, um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, we haven't directly engaged with that question. Let's say um, as a as something that that is something that we're definitely very important. But I feel like we're we have also accomplished a lot in the way that we kind of started off, which was. From, how do you go from a plush toy and this kind of fascination with objects and we can, you know, kind of keep just beating that drum and produce hundreds of exhibitions and kind of be everywhere in terms of publications. But for us, it was about we want to build, right? And how do we go from a plush toy and how do we make a plush toy to the scale of, an ar of architecture, if we, if we can say it that way. So the, the, then the, the inflatable projects begin to kind of allow us to increase in volume, begin to uh, uh, kind of tackle the scaled problem uh, in a more kind of direct and immediate way. And so, I mean, I think that, you, you know, I'm, I'm very proud of uh, the highest building we have done to date and that is 25 feet <laughs> right it's not that much but it's it's a lot in our kind of world in our language and so um, we're also very curious about how it's gonna happen but I think we're gonna make it happen so you know invite us back when we do that <laughs> or not <laughs> Well, I'll close out the lecture by saying that um, the projects that we finished this summer, we did at the end of July. Um, the last one, we lost at the end of October. <laughs> That's three months. That's good. Exactly. That's pretty good. Yeah. So your record yeah. is still, yeah. you're good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. For those of you interested, there is currently and will be for the remainder